Hello there Reason People, Pooh Bear here and welcome to my channel and today we're going to be looking at some envelope followers. I'm going to go through what an envelope follower is and we'll then have a look at all the different followers which are available within Reason and then after that I'm going to go through some examples of actually how you can take some audio data just like this and play an internal drum machine like this. So this audio now is actually playing the brand new Reason 10.4 drum machine. Yep, from that audio. So we're gonna be looking at some stuff like that. We'll also look at how we can take that same CV information and control uh, devices. Um, we'll have a quick look, well, we probably won't actually look at this dynamic EQ, but we can do dynamic EQ stuff with it. I'm actually gonna be doing a separate video on this color and EQ, because I'm planning on doing, um, well, I've, I've got a dynamic key tracking frequency fighter leveling EQ. So I'm gonna be going into details about that. And also down here uh, in this little section here, I've got this, what I call my auditioning leveler. So I don't know about you, but like it's two o'clock in the morning, you're looking for a sound, you put on a VST, put on a preset and your ears start bleeding because it's hit you at minus two dB and you think, really? You know, so what this leveler does is it makes sure whatever sound you're sort of shoving up, it will play it back at minus 12 dB for you without you having to do anything. But I call it an auditioning one. You can't use it for mixing. I'll go into details about that on that particular video. So what is a follower? Well, a follower is quite straightforward, really. It means that when your amplitude goes, level goes up, your volume is going up, the CV level follows it up. As it comes down, that CV level will come down, and as it goes up, it's just following that level up and down. It is as simple as that. Um, we have a number of devices in reason, and we're gonna have a look at each of them in turn. So I'm just gonna quickly turn off some scrolling stuff, and let's have a look. So this is the screen. I think of it as a hypersensitive um, follower. Um, it doesn't take much of a signal to actually get this one going. And in some examples I'm looking at, believe it or not, I've actually given it a 12 dB gain reduction um, just so we can actually look at the signal in the scopes a little bit later on. Um, it's quite straightforward to wire up. Um, and it's not going around to the back of the rack. There we go. Uh, you just use your this box standard audio in. And this is your follower here, auto CV output. Nice and straightforward. The next uh, one we're going to look at is actually the opposite. I think of this as quite a, a, a lazy follower. You need to get quite a lot of power into this to get a real proper signal coming out of it. Um, a lot of people know it because it does say follower on the front, which is quite nice. And on the back, we obviously we have our inputs again, and we have a lovely one which is labeled follower for us. So that's uh, very easy to wire up. Uh, the next one is going to be the first of our <coughs> gain reduction followers. Well, it's exactly the same, you know, um, as the gain reduction um, is coming out, we're getting a CV signals and it's just working exactly the same as the amplitude envelope follows as well. I suppose the big difference is you can actually control the input a lot more um, compared to the other followers, but I'll go through my setup in a minute. Um, so again, we've got um, audio in and this time we, we take the gain reduction uh, CV out um, to do our following with that particular device. Neptune, um, not so commonly used now. Obviously, it was used once upon a time. Um, again, we've got our audio in. Sorry, I'm right in the way here. And it's actually labeled Amplitude. So that's our envelope follower, which is coming out of the Neptune. Um, it's a bit of a funny device, this one. And it's one um, what's got me unstuck a couple of times. So it's, it's, a, one, it's a good one to know about. But uh, it's almost necessary to say that's my first port of call when I'm looking at followers. Uh, we've got the BV512. I do apologize if I end up saying 152. I keep calling it that for some reason. It is a 512. Um, it's a great, actually, little follower. Um, it, it has a little drawback, um, which is also a big plus side. <laughs> Um, the input is a little bit different. Obviously, you're coming through the modulator here rather than box standard inputs, but you've got 16 outs, and obviously the best way of running it is actually in the 16 band mode. Um, you could aggregate these up, um, so you don't have to worry about what signal you're putting in, but that's the difference with this one. You have, to, you, I say you're worrying, you've got to understand a little bit more about your signal, but something like with that drum pattern I was playing, this is absolutely great for, because obviously kicks are gonna be down here, hi-hats are up here, snare was in the middle, and there was also this like this open snare, cymbally thing going on. Um, 
And in fact, I actually used the Neptune in the end to pull that out um, because it is such a funny signal. You know, that's four layers which we're trying to cut through. So the, it's, this is quite a powerful one, but it just takes that little bit more setting up. Not a lot more, but just that little bit more and a little bit more thought needs to go into it. Now, the final follower I'm going to look at is actually a rack extension, but it's a free rack extension, and that's why I actually included it. It does have some drawbacks on it, um, like each of the followers you could say has only got a 12 dB range, but you can string them up. And in my auditioning uh, leveler, what I've got over here, I've actually strung four of these together, and that's what's giving me my 48 dB range. Um, one up's a little bit different because you've only got inputs on this, there's no outputs at all. You've got inputs on this, and then obviously you've got your CVs, which you can then take out. So they're the basic uh, followers, what we're going to be looking at today. Um, I think very quickly, we'll actually have a look at how I tend to set these things up. And then we'll actually have a look at all of these in action. And then we'll look at some other things as well. We've got a lot to get through. So this is sort of my sort of typical setup when if I'm looking at a follower. Um, I usually end up splitting the audio out to go into the following device. Um, and I usually create what I call dead end chains. And what I mean by dead end chain is that the output of these devices don't go anywhere. Yeah. So I'll always have input coming in, but the output doesn't go anywhere. So I refer to it as a dead end chain. So before the followers, I usually have some kind of um, way of controlling the audio going in, the gain going in. So obviously we've got the kilohertz there, which is obviously a freebie device. Um, I tend to use the, the cellular gain to be perfectly honest because I do like the, uh, the peak meter. Um, so we can need to control the audio going into the device and then out of the device, we've now into the CV world and the janitor is absolutely brilliant. And I usually follow that up and back it up with what's called the CV suite line um, processor and you will actually see both of these in action <clears throat> when I start going through my examples. From that I tend to go into the CV um, A7 and I run it in raw mode. Yeah, if you've got an integer mode, because obviously CV signals most people know is from minus one to one, well, no, no that, that's actually not quite true. When we're trying to push stuff in and out of instruments and we can use in, um, say, gate data and note data, as I say gate data actually is in more MIDI sort of it's not really MIDI, but it's CV gay data, if you know what I'm talking about. That's always between that range of 0 and 127, which is 0 and 1. But we're now in the realms of audio, and we can get up to CV signals of 10,000, which is actually ridiculous, because we then have to scale it right back down to fit into 0 to 1. Uh, um, yeah, sounds all crazy, but it sort of reminds me of when people talk about, oh, they want 64-bit audio, where you've got to drag everything straight back down to go out your little... 24-bit card, yeah, what's the point? So anyway, digressing. Um, so the analyzer is quite good, and it's good, quite good to run it into raw mode, and I always run a scope as well. It's worth buying this if you haven't got it. It's only about eight quid, um, and every now and then he does actually um, panda. Um, it's, I've seen it up there for free as well. Um, I just love the feedback I get from the scopes. Um, it gives you, yeah, it's, it's just really useful for me. And it will be really useful for you too. So let's actually um, have a look at all these followers actually uh, a little bit in working. I think I should be able to do this. So if I hold this key down here, there we go. And let me just pause what we're seeing on the screen. Now before we have a look at what we're going on here, that was just produced by this subtractor here. Um, it's just a box standard sine wave, nothing special. Um, I just want to draw your attention really to the amp envelope, what we've got going on the amp envelope. So obviously we've got some attack, we've got some decay, we've got some sustain, and obviously we've got some release. And obviously over here, it looks like we've got a universal shape of an ADSR as well. And I think if I do that key, we can bring them in. So this is what the followers, you know, I've held that key down, played that subtractor, and this is what the amplitude they've actually followed. Um, now, you might be looking at, and they're all sort of slightly different levels. Uh, yes, they are. As I said, the scream, I've absolutely halved the signal going into it. The pulverizer, I think I've doubled the signal to get a little bit more height on it. Um, you may look at, this is the first of the gain reduction. So, so these relate to one-to-one. -to -one. Um, it's the first of the uh, gain reductions. 
um, and you may notice there's a little bit of wobbles going on these. Nice note to worry about with wobbles. It doesn't make it bad, doesn't make the signal terrible. It comes down to really what you're doing with the signal and if you do want it to follow it exactly or not. Um, and this is the other gain um, reduction one here. And you might notice on both of these is, well, they've actually cut short. They've actually cut part of the tail, um, the front off, and they've actually cut there's no release on them either. And that's quite straightforward. It's because they work off a threshold. So once the threshold goes below, they just stop the processing the signal. So when it's above that threshold, you get the signal. Now I could turn the threshold down and these would start and end here. The only difference is, is they'll end up disappearing somewhere up there in the big wide world. And all you'd get to see is a line going up and then flat and then coming down again. So hence why I set the thresholds uh, the way I did. Um, the Neptune I've always noticed has a funny little blip, so it seems like that's actually got some kind of small little threshold on it as well. Um, and yeah, so that's really how a follower works. So that's why we call it an envelope follower, because it's given us our shape of an envelope, what we're pretty much used to seeing. Right. So let's actually look at um, manipulating, um, say, a drum sound and how we can then obviously use this data, what we're actually viewing here, um, to our advantage. So I'm just going to go back into a different view. He says, looking at his keyboard, it's not that key, it must be that one. So we're going to take a very box standard, uh, and it should be that one there, drum beat. And I'm just going to put my headphones on so I can hear what you guys are hearing. And we've actually got the analyzer going now. Right, let's start with, let's actually have a quick look and see what we've um, actually captured. So this is our drum beat, if you know it is going boom, 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 boom. And as you can see different, and you can see the different shapes already. And this is what I like about using these analyzers is because um, what we're going to be doing with this data is we're going to be using it as gate data to another device. And if you're using gate data, you would need to get to what we call the zero line, the zero CV line, and then it has to go above to re-trigger that gate. So straight away, you could say, well, looking at some of these, this is a good, not a bad one, because we've got a few flat things coming on. This is the Neptune. Yeah, we've got that's not looking too bad at all. In fact, yeah, believe it or not, that's actually quite a good one. Uh, this is the BV512. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's giving us quite a nice signal, which we can just sharpen up. And, I, and I'll show you in a second how we do sharpen this up. And then we're um, down to the uh, RE180, which actually does give a, um, it does work quite well, say with some say drum beats and that. But let's actually have a look at the top. And in fact, we go through each one in turn and you'll, you'll understand why what makes a good um, follower for a particular sound and what doesn't make a good follower for a particular sound. In this particular case, there's never, you're never, never, never going to get Scream to work on this particular kick. I can see it and I don't even have to look any further. And if you're thinking about, oh, what am I looking at? Well, I don't know if I can scale this up a bit. Uh, yeah, I have scaled up a little bit. What I'm looking at is we've got this little, it's a little tiny little peak here coming, then it's coming down, it's going back up again. And then we obviously we've got another dip coming down here, which is then going back up into a peak. If you actually look at this little line here, I know it might be quite hard to see, there's actually a line. This peak is below this dip. And what that means is no matter what I do with that signal, trying to manipulate that signal, I cannot get both of them coming down to that zero dB line to go back up again. If I pull this one down to the zero dB line, that one's never going to come to the zero dB line. And if I pull that one to the zero dB line, well, that one's gone below it and I've lost it. Yeah. So I know for a fact, looking at that, I'm never going to get that drum pattern. Yeah, that drum pattern, that, or that kick, is never going to work on a drum machine. We could do something with this one because if you notice this peak here is below this dip so we could pull these down to the zero db line we could get something out of it but it'd be a little bit more messing around 
Whereas when we come down to these ones, we can actually see they're already a lot closer to what we are actually looking for. So if I hit that button there maybe, I think it's that button there I want it actually. Um, what that's doing is that at the moment is playing, so this is going off to a punch DB. So let's put it into the top one. So this is our gate going off from the screen. Yeah, not a lot's really happening, is it? <laughs> it is absolutely dead as a donut. So let me get the um, screens going again for you. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag this over here a bit. And this is where you can start seeing how I'm gonna manipulate um, using things like the janitor, how we can manipulate the signal and all the rest of it. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna actually pull the offset down. And you can see, as soon as I started to pull the offset down, we're, we're getting something, whereas before we weren't getting anything. The next thing I'm going to actually do is I'm actually going to push up this trim to zero. And what that's doing, as you can see, we've now flattened the bottom off and it's getting a little bit more rhythmic. So again, we can pull that, that offset down. And it's just not... Nah, see, we're not get, we're not getting there. So let's go on to the um, pulverizer. Again, we're not getting much in the way of a signal, but again, we can just start to pull this down. And what I'm looking at, this is my zero zero line here, and I'm trying to get these two dips down to the right one. And again, let's bring that trim up to zero. And we get, we're getting a lot closer to what the original was. In fact, I'd say we've, we've actually got that. And this is this is how we, we manipulate them. Uh, this is the, the first of the game. And again, it's usually always about, let's pull that offset down and see what's going on. And don't be scared about putting these offsets right down and you end up with next to nothing of a signal. And again, I'm gonna push up my trim to zero. Yeah. Neptune. Now, you can hear like some overruns. So you can hear all these double sort of duh, 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 beats going. And that's purely because obviously, um, scale that yeah it's because that line is going just a bit below it and above the the zero db line but again with a small amount of offset on this one won't need much oops i've gone way way too ott on that one and bringing up the trim to zero that's not bad And it's got, and because it's got um, the peaks are obviously at different levels, we are hitting the different velocities going on. So when you put it down too much, you do actually lose a little bit of velocity data. But with something like the um, the MIDI compressor, you can actually make up your velocity data at a later stage. And that's a player advice, by the way. Um, so if we go and look at the BV five one two. Again, probably just putting a bit of offset down. And then up to zero. Yeah, that was, that was a quite a quick one to get in. And finally, this is our other um, gain reduction one. So I'm actually gonna pull the trim up to start with in this particular one. Get that up to zero. A little bit of offset, and it probably won't need much offset this one. I might even bring the signal down a little bit. So yeah, so as you can see, sometimes some of them do wind you up a little bit because you can't 
you're not gonna you're not going to be able to tune them in. So you're going to go for another one which is giving you a lot better signal, which is going to work quite well. I mean, this one isn't a million miles away out, but I have got some little bits of, of glitches going on there. And with a little bit more tuning, you probably could get that one to work. But as I say, well, why spend too much time trying to get that to work when you can uh, quite easily just uh, find one which is working for you. And that's basically the tuning in um, of, of getting this audio now, obviously to, to play a drum machine. Quiet, thank you. So we actually go back to the, that drum pattern we had. Um, there it is. So what we're gonna do now with that particular drum pattern it's actually going, as you can see, already going through my followers. And I've actually got this wired up to the Neptune. And from the Neptune, I am coming over to uh, this device here. This is where I'm coming into this device here. And in fact, I have got it wired up to the volume level and a little bit of reso there. So we're going to hear a few things going on there. So with Let's stop the drum pattern for a second, zoom back out of that. Um, this is what it sounds, yeah, this is what it sounds like. A straightforward sort of sound. I will have to apologize for the little clicks and pops you hear every now and then, but because of the way I had to configure OBS up with reason, because I've got going to be using an open mic within reason and OBS at the same time. So it's a straightforward sound. So let's actually kick off that drum pattern and see what's going to happen to that sound now. And I'm going to play, start playing the same sort of things. sort of thing for hours because I love it so much and obviously we can actually change the drum pattern and you don't think you're restricted to drum patterns either listening to there or what's that following that's what it's following and I think I've got one more over here And that is, yeah, so you, there's obviously loads of different audio sources out there which you can actually go and grab um, and you just can wire up into the different, obviously, CV um, ports on the back of a device. And don't forget, if um, a particular device is missing particular CV ports, whack it in a combinator, get that CV signal coming, one of the, uh, you can go coming from the rotary or you can actually put it into the CV in and then you can get that to actually control because so much of it's exposed within a combinator. So you can actually really control a real lot of stuff there. Um, and you can also, um, I'm just gonna turn my mic on. So now my mic is now on within Reason. He says it is, yes it is, I can see it coming in now. And um, even using my voice, I can start talking and I'm gonna affect what's gonna happen to my synthesizer or whatever I'm playing. It's a bit weird talking and, and hearing this going on at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit off-putting. But you know, you can do other things. Um... And all I'm doing is just playing chords. I am just playing. That is all I'm doing. 
until I talk. So yeah, you can have a lot more fun with this sort of stuff. And we're now going to go into a little bit of a, a crazy Pooh Bear mode where I'm going to be using an open mic and everything you see is happening for real. There's, I'm, I'm not going to do any trickery. Uh, yeah, because I'm going to be look, doing some silly things. But if you think about the silly things, there's actually a serious side behind them. Um, and I'm going to be using some different um, angles because I'm going to be doing stuff down here and I'm not being rude down here. No. So um, let's have a quick look at some of this crazy stuff. Boom! Boom! Ow! Boom! Ow! Boom! 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 Ow! Boom! 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 Ow! Boom! Boom! Ow! Boom! Boom! Ow! 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 Boom! Ow! 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 Boom! Well, I hope you enjoyed that last bit of fun. It was just a, a little bit of fun. Um, and then you never know, it might inspire you to go off and do something a little bit crazy and get some nice results out of it. So we're on to the final bit of this presentation. I know it's been quite a long bit of presentation, but we're now going to be looking at more of the geeky stuff. We're going to have a look at some of the numbers and we're going to have a look at one or two other things like over this side, I've got like a, I suppose this would be a quid of a dynamic 
it's not quite a dynamic EQ or anything like that going on, but we'll be looking at the dynamics of how quick we can get a signal out and what's going to happen to that signal. We'll, we'll look at that a bit more closely in a minute. Um, but let's have a look at some, some of the numbers and this might explain why these act the way they do act. Um, if you remember right at the beginning, I said Scream, which was a real hypersensitive um, follower. And the reason being is it actually starts to give you a CV signal, i.e. 0. 0.0001 uh, when it's at about minus 144 dB. Uh, the next following that would be the pulverizer, even though the pulverizer is a real slow one, and, you're, and uh, you'll see why in a second, uh, and you really have to drive a signal through it. It actually does start off quite low at a minus 110 dB. The next one after that will be the BV512, which is around about minus 100, um, was it 110? I think it's uh, minus 100 dB that that one was kicking off. And then we start to go into realms of a bit of a funny area because we've got, um, you could say we could look at our two um, compressors. And the reason I say these are funny areas because obviously they've got a threshold. Yes, the threshold goes down to minus 36 on the, the M class and on the RE180, it can go down to 60. But the RE180 only has a, um, a 12 dB span. And what I mean by that is from zero to one, it's just a 12 dB gap and that's all you've got. Of course you could string multiples together and then you can use the scaling to start scaling things down to get back into that zero to one. So I'm gonna not talk about too much more of the RE180 at this particular stage because you do have to set certain other things up to get it to work a certain way. The main thing is it has a signal from zero to one, uh, it's a 12 dB scan, and you could say actually it's quite logarithmic and uh, with the figure you actually get out of there, whereas everything else is totally non-logarithmic and can be quite a, uh, quite a pain to try and get in certain areas when you're trying to scale things down because it, it, it really doesn't quite scale down the way you think it's going to. Um, so I said about the compressors and then we've got Neptune. Neptune, if you remember rightly, on the ADSI, it had that funny little blip. Um, as I said, it, it's got like its own little threshold and it is quite weird and it doesn't actually start kicking in to around about minus 130 on that one. Um, DB, and the, but once you've got it following, you can actually back it off and go all the way back down to minus uh, 50 DB. So it's got this funny threshold that it is starting to follow and you can actually back it right off. And as soon as you go over that 50, you lost the signal again, you've got to come right back up to that minus 30 again to get it to start following again. So it's a, a, a little bit of a weird one, the way that one works. Um, the next figure which we're really interested in, so that's from our uh, because we looked at our zero signal, CV zero, would be where is it at one? Well, the scream at minus 28 dB is actually hitting um, CV one. And that's why this one is so sensitive. Whereas if we were to look at uh, the pulverizer, um, to get to CV one on that, you need to be plus, um, plus four dB on that particular one. The compressor is a bit of a weird one because it tops out at 0.5. It doesn't matter what sort of signal you pump into it, it has a maximum signal of 0.5, and that will be um, near enough near the um, 0 dB mark, that would be actually as well. So it'd be quite close to the 0 dB, dB mark. Um, where are we now? We're on to the Neptune. The Neptune uh, to get to CV1 would be around about minus 8 dB and we're getting close again to the zero db on the 512 so that's quite a nice one because it's obviously then got a nice range going from around about minus 100 db up to zero db to get your zero to your one which is uh, quite a nice span but it explains why this, the scream is so hypersensitive so, you know minus 28 db we're already hitting our one which is you know, the topping out of most <laughs> CVs in on devices, what we really want to use them on. When we're pumping them through other things, we can obviously go a lot higher, um, but we as I say, we need to bring that signal down when we're actually starting to pump them into um, actual musical devices or other effect devices, because they really are looking for, for that range between most of them minus one and one. Um, if we do actually have a, a zero dB signal, uh, on the zero dB signal going in, screen will actually be on the CV10. Um, Pulverizer is only on 0.6. So again, it shows you that you've really, you've really got to overdrive the pulverizer to get it up to uh, a, a one, or you need to scale it up. 
Um, as I've already said, the compressor will be 0.5 and the Neptune is, um, will be CV 2.7. Um, and, and I already mentioned about the BV512, which will be um, B1. Now, if we were to look at the maximum you could sort of push these up to, um, then um, the, as I said, the compressor is 0.5, it's never going to go higher than that. The, uh, the RE180, yeah, that's going to be a maximum of one. Um, Scream hits its maximum, which is CV10, and that is at minus 7 dB. Again, this is why this is so hypersensitive, yeah. Um, then it, to get the maximum out of the BV512, uh, you need a plus 21 dB, which will give you CV10, and then we're going to get into the real big numbers. First of all, with the Neptune, if you go up to a plus 72 dB, you can get a CV10,000 out of that and you would need to go up to plus 85 dB on the pulverizer um, and that will go up to 10,000. However, if you pump um, an 85 dB signal into the pulverizer with the follower connected, it will crash. Yeah, um, Don't have the follower in and you can pump a lot higher um, dB signal through that and it won't crash, but once the follower's connected up and you are pumping that kind of high signal through it, it will crash. Why you'd be pumping an 85 dB signal through these, I do not know. But I thought I'd give you your, your maximum range on, on these. Um, as I say, it makes sense why the scream is so hypersensitive. It makes sense now why the pulverizer isn't as sensitive, because obviously at 0 dB, it's still only 0.6. This has hit its maximum at minus um, 7. In fact, it's hit 1 at minus 28 dB. So it sort of explains really why these are the way they are. Um, the other thing to touch on with each of these um, is once the signal's going through, and obviously we're doing a convert from one to the other, um, i.e. from audio into CV, there is a, a latency in itself. Um, and we'll be looking at most of them around about um, a 64 batch size. Now, I don't know if I've got a super size screen. Oh, that's a super size screen. So if I just drag this over here, ah, oh, there we go, we can pull this in. So the screen has a 64 samples, as it says there, and interestingly, I've called it a sample and hold. If you've got a really fast release, it will leave that CV signal wherever it was left at. So if you suddenly cut your audio off, it will actually leave you um, a high uh, CV signal. That in itself is a bit of a, ooh, bah. Ooh, you know, it, depending what you want to do, a sample and hold, there we go. You've got yourself a, a, a follower that has got that sort of built in, which is quite nice. Obviously, if, you've got, if it fades off or there's a slow release on it, it's going to follow that release down. You know, but it's, when it, you cut any audio dead, you can leave your signal wherever it was, which is quite nice. Pulverizer, um, I've got down there, yeah, it's 64 samples, so it's one batch we're really talking about. Um, and a, a little comment there, four times signal, I really is having to pump the signal into that to really get a nice high CV signal. And as, as you saw, as I said, to get um, a CV1, you need a plus four dB signal just to get to CV1. Now the compressor, this was interesting. Um, when I was testing this, it was switching between a 64 sample sort of size it was is taken up to 320. It was kind of switching. It wasn't, it is quite a random switch as well. Whereas with the Neptune, whenever I was doing my testing, I was switching between one minute is taken 128 samples and the next minute is taken 384. It, it was quite a, a flip flop. Um, that one. And I, I don't know why I, I haven't got an answer for you. This is what it's doing, and uh, it confused the hell out of me. Um, the BV512, a straightforward to, uh, 64 batch size, and the RE180, it was sort of saying, no, it didn't take any sample time up at all to process um, that audio into CV. And again, it had a kind of sample and hold result. Um, so once it's got a signal up to a certain thing, and you suddenly cut that audio dead, it will stay at that particular range. Um, or that that level, um, but as I said, that's got a funny d a 12 dB range, so it's, it is a funny little um, device. But with a bit more wiring up, you can do a lot more with it. 
So now we understand a little bit about the difference uh, in the samples, um, we can actually have a look at them more in action. And hopefully I can bring this screen here. I need to bring this over a lot more. Let's see what we've got going on. And I'm going to end up zooming in and losing stuff, I think, if I remember rightly on this. Um, did I get a real zoom in No, That's gonna be the closest zoom in I can do. So let me just see if I can get all the devices in. Right, so if I quickly explain what we're actually looking at here, and it's, it's, it's quite straightforward. Each one's got its own follower, so we've got a compressor up on that side, and it's the BV512, which is driving this screen, compressor's driving that one, um, obviously the screen's driving this one here. So my fingers are disappearing off the screen. Look, oh. And the, that one there is the Neptune. Um, so basically I've got a, an audio signal coming into the follower, which we're converting into a CV signal, which is going through the janitor. We are then also bringing that same audio signal in on the same path, which is something I'll talk about in a minute about um, audio signal paths. And that's actually going into this delay unit. And from this delay unit, um, with then pumping the audio signal through this particular kilohertz gain. And what I've got is I'm taking the follower and it's on the gain reduction. So we're reducing the gain down and I've more or less done it the same on all of them. So if I was to very, very quickly go through and just switch these all off and put, put these into bypass mode, that's already in bypass mode. And let's put that into bypass mode. So now what you're seeing is the signal where if you're using this, say, in a, a dynamic EQ, this is what you're gonna see. Your transients are going to go through. And by the way, the signal I'm pumping through is it's just a simple sine wave, which is being controlled by uh, an LFO square. So I'm pulsing the signal through. Um, and hence, you, the, the transients is getting through on all the devices. And if you look closely in some of them, you'll actually see this line getting thicker, thicker and thinner. And that's when I was saying to you, when I was talking about earlier, with some of the devices, they seem to take different sample um, times to process the data and that will actually show up um, in, in these. Um, so what you need to do to obviously, um, especially if you're building a, a, uh, some kind of um, dynamic EQ or whatever, you've got to delay your audio signal by at least the amount of samples of what you're seeing uh, here on the screen. So in the case of say the pulverizer, um, if I actually turn this on, I've actually set it up, so I'm actually delaying it by 123 samples. Um, it's more or less got rid of that transit, and you can see there's this little tiny blip, blip on it, and I actually deliberately left that blip on there, so I can now just come here and just turn this up to 128. Uh, is that 26, 27, 28, and that should more or less flatten that blip right out, and as you can see, it's flattened it totally out. So I'm now, got my audio coming down, you know, because it's being processed, the CV signal's being delayed because my audio's carrying on. It's hitting this delay device now, so my CV signal's now catching up with it, and it's processing it at the same time. But you, unfortunately, you're not gonna get that on all of them. And in fact, if I pick on the screen, because, yeah, the screen's a nasty one. Um, and partially because, if you think about it, what I've said, what have I got set up? I've got an audio signal set up where I am uh, just cutting dead. So it's gonna leave its signal high. And what I've done is I've now just turned this delay on and you can see it's now blipping up the other way. And if I turn, I think this one on the Neptune, we might start seeing this, did I type it? No, I didn't quite put it in the same result. Um, and the reason it's blipping up is because we're delaying the audio that much that the CV signals come along, it's brought the gain down, then the audio's come in and the gain's released. And then obviously we're now getting the blip up of the other end. Now, if you're getting that type of thing, and we understand why it's happening with the screen, um, because I say it's got a sample and hold type effect, um, we can, um, we can smooth these signals out if that was actually happening. And the way to smooth that CV signal out is obviously we've got a delay here which I haven't talked about on the janitor. So by turning up something like the delay, we can now kick off that back end bit. And in fact, by obviously turning this up probably even more, what we're going up to about 900 samples here. 
And uh, no, we're we going a bit worse. It never might kick in. There we go. It's kicked in. Um, so now we've we've taken the 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 uh, CV signal and we've delayed the audio a bit more. So the CV signal is going to hit that that gain. Make sure it's fully down. The audio signal is going to come in. We've got a delay, so it's just going to hold on to it for that little bit longer before it re releases it. But you can obviously square these off and you do need to have different delay times like i've got 100 so with the pulverize it's a nice one it literally is 128 and that seems to sink it in with something like the uh the, at the top here we've got the bvs um i was playing around with the signal here and i think i've got to go up to something like uh 700 samples or maybe it was 800 samples yeah we're very close there you can see it's a blip so i can probably start going up in, tw in tens here now so it was, we were on 720 and you notice every now and then you make a change and you've got to let it settle down so that settled settled down around about 720 samples so that's going to be around about a 15 millisecond delay might be a bit more on that um 16 70 milliseconds delay um the interesting one as i say was the um the compressor um because as i say it seemed to be doing this flip-flop between what it was it was up to with the signal that's coming in you you do really um, so there it goes you can see it's now nearly gone flat and we're at 328 and then next minute you know you'll actually start seeing that transient start creeping through um it's just a, a little bit of a weird one which is going on there with some of these followers of why they're not really processing at the same sample rate in fact it's sort of showing me up here and it's actually kept it low you only got like a little bit of a blip but you can see that the signal is doing slightly different things and there we go it hasn't let me down <laughs> so it's now suddenly letting this transient come through um, quite bizarre what's going on with that particular one um, but obviously you can obviously increase the the amount of delay but if you're increasing the delay for your audio you then want to actually start increasing your delay really on your cv signal to get things all smoothed off but yeah so oh sorry that's a little bit of a waffle that one and a little bit of a confusing one but that's the main thing is to remember that there is going to be a sample to delay on, on these followers and we've got to really match up any audio if we're doing something with the audio, especially with something like a dynamic EQ. Okay, if you're still with me, wow, top bananas, top bananas. Um, I'm gonna make, uh, these packages will be available on my CV Dropbox and I'll make sure I'll put some uh, uh, things in the description. So I'm starting to lose my word, it's just been such a long video. Um, and I'll also put up um, a, a screen grab, I say screen grab, I'll, I'll pull up my notes about the what the um, rate uh, they kick in at. Um, so CV0, you know, it'd be, screen would be kicking at 144 dB when they actually get to um, CV1 and their maximum amount. So I'll put together a little slide to do with all that so you can obviously download that and not have to listen to me waffle through it all again. <laughs> Oh, God. Anyway, made it to the end. And if you've made it to the end, um, congratulations to you. Um, and thank you for watching. And uh, I will be doing a couple more see, uh, videos soon, really r r around the followers. Um, yeah. So bye for now.